Okay, in this video, what we're going to do is talk about viewports and projections. A very important concept for you guys to get your head wrapped around. Now, it may be a bit confusing, mm -hmm. just a little bit, but don't worry. As we begin applying the things we're talking about in this video into our applications, the concepts are going to become more and more clear. Definitely. So some of you guys are going to get it first time right through. Some of you guys, it's going to be just a little bit foggy. Don't worry. I'll try to be as clear as possible, and Joel will definitely be as clear as possible. Definitely. So what's it all about? Well, first of all, when creating an application that utilizes OpenGL, at some point, we obviously need a viewport, mm -hmm. which is really just a window into our virtual world that we create. That's right. That's all it is. But... It's OpenGL's equivalent to a window. Yeah, but here's an interesting thing for mm -hmm. you. Cameras. There is no camera in OpenGL. Right. A lot of you that are watching these videos may be familiar with 3ds Max or Maya, where you have a viewport, but it's associated with a camera. Mm -hmm. And that camera is kind of sending a feed back in regards to what it can see in the virtual world to your viewport. That's right. Which is very handy. But we don't have that luxury here with OpenGL. That doesn't make things confusing. It just means that you need to think about things slightly it different. It can be confusing if you're not viewing it in the right way. That's right. Now, here's an interesting thing to think about. Up to this point, we've talked about the model view matrix and mm -hmm. the importance of setting it. So we've then established a point in which we are going to create things. Then we create something. Right. Then we can push it or pop one off the stack or just plain out modify the worldview matrix mm -hmm. and then make another object. And we continue doing this, and this is how we are constructing our objects in the world. Right. Be it vertices, faces, or whatever, right? So we've done that. Now, all of these objects exist in the world. That has nothing to do with the way we see them. Right. Because when we view the objects, we're viewing them mm, through a viewport with a different type of perspective. It that's could right. be with could be an orthogonal view. Mm -hmm. It could be with perspective that's like the way we see things. Mm -hmm. It could be some sort of custom view that's right. of the scene. So things are stored mathematically in the world. Mathematical precision X, Y, and Z. Right, a, a Euclidean way of viewing things. Yeah, uh, we ooh. always view everything as X, Y, and Z, and it's absolute. And if you have two lines, they're parallel and exactly. so on. Exactly, but it's in the real world when we walk around. That's not how we view things. No, we, if we if we look down a railroad track, for example, it what goes, happens to the two rails? They they, they basically into a point. exactly they vanish into a point. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of distortion going on. There is. So now we've got to tell OpenGL that we want to take this world that we've created right. using these very precise numbers and all and convert that over into, I guess you could say, screen space in which mm -hmm. we're going to be visualizing things in a particular way. And we've got That's to define right. that particular way that our world is going to be shown to us in that viewport. Right, which is a 2D area. That's right. And that's, a, that's, that's the main thing, really, is because we have a 3D area, a 3D world, and we need to convert that into something that can be displayed on a 2D area. And 2D our, our monitor, screen. that's right. right. So, this is going to be a lot of fun. The first thing I want to do is talk to you about the uh, lack of cameras. Right, and how do we fix this? And how do we fix this? This is really cool. Let's go ahead and switch over to a whiteboard real quick. I'll see if I can draw some really nasty diagrams for you guys. Nice. So, if you guys recall from the last few videos, as we've been talking about transformations, etc., mm -hmm. that um, you know when we first begin, when we first initialize OpenGL, the worldview matrix is set at the identity matrix. Right. It's reset. So at this point, if we go to create anything, where are we creating? At the origin. Right here at the origin, because remember our translate X, Y, and Z our with zero, our identity zero, zero. matrix is zero, zero, zero. Mm -hmm. So if I was to come in here and create a cube right here, this is what the cube's going to look like. It's going to look like this. It said it made it zero, zero, zero. But we're going to be... That's a crooked cube. I, okay. <laughs> that, just cut me some slack. <laughs> now, we're going to be right here. So right. what are we going to see? We're going to see well, the inside of the cube. We're going to see the, the inside of the cube, and it really depends on the size of the cube. Right, it does. I mean, if it gets too small... It could be outside of our near clipping range, and right. we don't see it at all. Yeah. It could be so large, it's outside of our far clipping range, right. we don't see it at all. And so on. Or it could be at a point where we see just a solid sheet of color, where right. we're looking at only a part of the face, mm -hmm. or we could see parts of the other four faces connected to right. it that make up the cube. Six faces and all. Yeah. Now, we're going 
to make some, some a very simple application coming up, and we're going to create a cube in this application, and we're going to dis, we're going to show you creating this application using several different Windows interfaces. Mm-hmm. But all the OpenGL stuff is going to, for the most part, Stay remain the same. The same right. right. And here's what's really cool: when we create that cube and we look at it for the very first time through our crisp new viewport, what we're going to see is the face of of the cube right there. Right. We're going to be inside the cube. Right. It won't even look like a cube. So how do we move our camera? How do we navigate our camera around Mm -hmm. so that we can see the the cube, all the faces of the cube? Because in the end, it becomes very important how we look into our virtual world. I mean, if you can't move your camera around, (laughs) your invisible camera around, what are you going to do? But check it out. Isn't, Isn't the discussion Joel and I are having right now a bit confusing? We're talking about moving a virtual camera around, but there's not a camera at all. Right. This goes back to the last video when we talked about transformations mm-hmm. and we talked about the worldview matrix. Remember how we showed our, our you model guys view matrix. a model view. I keep doing that. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. The model view matrix. Remember when we uh, discussed hierarchies that basically let's uh, I'm just going to come down over here. So we create something. Let's say this is zero, zero, zero. Mm-hmm. Right. And if we were to say we're going to move five units over an X and create something, then we've made that something right here. Right. I made a little cone. OK. Now, at this point, if I say let's move um, just two units in Y, in y then, and then make a, a square, we're going to have this, right? Mm-hmm. And I said just move two units. It's relative. Right. That's the key thing. All transformations you do with the model view matrix using GL translate, GL scale, GL rotate are relative transformations. That's right. Now, we're looking over here. If, again, let me find my, there we are. A top view. Right. So this is. So we're, we have a top-down view here. So this is going to be X. Right, and that's. This Z. is going to be Z. Mm-hmm. And what we want to do is make our camera come back this way. Right. Actually, is this negative Z? Yeah. Because this is going to be coming right. out at us. So we want to simulate our camera. Where are we at? There we are. We want to make it look like our camera is, let's say, five units back. Right. Mm-hmm. So we're going to be looking at things like such. Mm-hmm. How do we do this? Well, let's use the uh, the model view matrix to our advantage. Right. How about right after we do a GL clear, the very first thing we do is a GL translate, and let's say we uh, zero and X. Right. We do negative five. And and then, or excuse me, zero and X, zero and Y, and negative five and Z. Right. So what's going to happen? Well, let's find where my mouse is. Um, Guys, I'm sitting a long ways away from the monitor right now. That's why it's so hard for me to see this. So basically, at this point, we have set our model view matrix up so that we're creating objects right here. Right. So now, at that point, we we always do that. Right. So we clear, and we immediately do this GL translate, setting Z at a negative 5. Yep. Now we begin. We create our cube. Okay? So the cube is created right here, correct? Mm Mm-hmm. Now... Where are we? Well, we are right here. Where we were before. Where we were before, right? Because there's no camera to move around. Look at this. This is quite interesting if you think about it. That, that, those are arrows, right? Okay. Right. So basically, we've, we've basically set up the same type of thing. Right. So where we're looking at, from our point of view, it looks like the cube is five units away from us. Right. And now at this point, if we continue building on... To, so if, if we can, you know, push the, uh, the model view matrix onto the stack, we make some more adjustments, we pop that back off later right. on, we make more adjustments from that. Basically, what we've done is we have defined every single piece of geometry that we create as children right. to us. Exactly. If, if that makes sense. That does make sense. That okay, makes good. perfect sense. And, and to me, I, I find that very interesting. So yeah, this is. means at this point, if we wanted to add rotations, so d- you know, if we wanted our camera to even be rotated or something else, mm-hmm. we can do all of that with the GL translate and rotate, etc. Exactly. Ahead of time. Right. And then we begin building all. Then of everything objects. basically moves relative to where we started Aha, out. Ha! Precisely. Mm-hmm. And in essence, it's as if we had moved a virtual camera. That's exactly right. Cool. Okay. So with that, let's go ahead and jump back over to the. Uh, Super cool slideshow. Exactly. Viewports and projections. Okay, now let's go ahead and advance a page. So we can look at viewport stuff. Yeah. So how do we create our viewport for our window? That's right, because obviously that's important. It is kind of important. (laughs) So in OpenGL, we're given one function call to do this, the GL viewport command. And this allows us to specify inside of our window where we want OpenGL to draw all of our information. Right. So in this case, we could specify... You know, what if we want to draw inside this entire window? We want to cover this entire window, mm-hmm. right? 
Well, to do that, we can simply call GL viewport, and we have four parameters, X, Y, width, and height. In this case, our window width is 500. Right. So we simply pass 500 to here. Our height's 200, so pass that into here. And, and X and, X and y, y is generally a The zero. Top, top left. Top um, right. Uh, no, top it, left. Yeah. Right. <laughs> top and left. The top there and we left. Go. There we go. So we have the top left right here, which is zero, zero. Right. And that specifies the entire window. Right. So, like, if you have a resize event, you want to recall GL viewport. So with the new size, you fill in the That's entire correct. area. Now, of course... You don't have to make your viewport fit your window. No. There's going to be times where you may want your viewport to fit perhaps half the window, and you're going to use the other half of the for window for other stuff. Exactly. So to do that, you know, it's just a matter of, in this case, if we wanted to do only half the window in regards to the width, mm -hmm. we could simply call GL viewport and pass it 0, 0, 250. Right, which would be half of this. So that's not going to affect our window size. It's no. just going to affect the viewport that's being created. Right, and another interesting side effect to this is that our triangle is going to get squished into that area. That's correct. Everything that we want, because we have two viewing areas. We have our window, and then we have the virtual world coordinates, if you will. So, in this case, we had our from negative one to one, and from negative one to one. So, no matter what our width is, it's still going to display everything inside that virtual area. That's right. So I just thought I'd point that out. Yeah, that, that's very cool. Um, so with we're about to get a, a better understanding of the negative one to positive one here in about two seconds. Exactly. So, so projections. Let's talk about this right. for a second. We have several different ways in which we can handle projections. Mm -hmm. We've got the orthogonal way, which is almost like a... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? An AutoCAD person, right. uh, a draftsman who's looking yeah. at everything in a 2D... An architect. Uh, an architect, thank you. That's yeah. the word I was looking for. 2D, non-objective view, mm -hmm. where lines remain parallel. It's very important, obviously, exactly. uh, to have a view like this. Right, and a non-distorted view. A non-distorted view. Oh, mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. So that is an orthogonal view, and um, or an orthogonal projection. Right. And then that, we have that. We also have a perspective projection, which we're going to get to in just a minute, mm -hmm. which is going to simulate... Real world viewing, the way we as humans view things in the real world. Right. Go back to those uh, railroad tracks. Again, they have a vanishing point where they merge together off in the distance. That's right. So at that, in that case, the world is being distorted. Mm -hmm. we, exactly. We're just so used to it, we don't realize it. Exactly. And then, of course, we can have custom projections as well. If we were creating some type of projection for some type of side-scrolling game right. or whatever it may be. Yeah, if you want to create some sort of weird distorted effect. I mean, yeah, and you can directly modify. Because we have, remember, we have our model view matrix. That's right. And we also have a projection matrix we that do. we can directly modify. In fact, before calling GL Ortho or any of these ones that we're about to see, you first will use our... Matrix mode, which will set what kind of matrix which we're basically, using. basically, yeah, that's exactly what it does. It tells right. OpenGL, this is the matrix we're about to be performing modifications Exactly. For. And then you do exactly what we did with the model view matrix, in which you set a GL load identity. So reset so everything. We reset it. Exactly. And now we can use, in this case here, we can load an orthogonal projection. And right. you can see the matrix is actually laid out for you right yep. there on the screen. Um, or, where R, L is and, and right R being and left. Exactly right. And then yeah. T and B being top and bottom, and F and N being... Z near and Z far. Exactly. Uh -huh. And, of course, we can go in there and we can create our own 4x4 matrix. Right, our own custom matrix. So we have now, I guess you could say, a custom projection. Right. And then we can load that into the current set matrix, which would be the projection matrix in this case. Yeah, exactly. Just like with we did in the last lesson with GL load matrix. Right. So there are two functions that we can use to create our orthogonal projection. The easy way and the hard way. Exactly. <laughs> um, we have our utility, which is provided in the GLU set of libraries, which and, is the OpenGL utility and library. And remember, those utility functions are generally set up to make life a little bit easier. Yes, for us. make it a little and bit more sensitive. And you're about sensible. to really see that here in a second. Yeah, definitely. Um, especially with the perspective. Exactly. <laughs> um, with GL ortho, you have six parameters that you pass, a left, right, bottom, and top, and a Z near and Z far. Um, a very important concept concept inside of OpenGL is your viewing volume. Right. Inside of OpenGL, with an orthogonal projection, remember, and it, no distortion happens. It does not go into a point. So what you get is basically a cubicle area in which the viewer can see things. This means your, your scale for the objects you create need to be, needs to be handled accordingly. Exactly. And, and the whole Z near Z far thing comes into play when OpenGL decides which objects should be drawn and which objects which objects shouldn't be drawn. Exactly. Um, basically, so they fall out of the clipping range. Exactly. So, so basically, you have a cube 
the uh, viewing area. Right. That if it gets outside of that area, OpenGL does not draw. It. Exactly. And so you can specify that with ZNear and ZFAR. And this can be useful. Remember, ortho- orthographic projections are not just useful in architectural contexts. They can also be used in things like games if you want to create a side scroller, 2D side scroller, or a 2D game. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can specify left, right, bottom, top, and just. Dis- uh, basically set your virtual world. But to make it easier, we have our GLU Ortho 2D. That's right. So now we can enter two less arguments. <laughs> exactly. Two less <laughs> arguments that allow us to just specify our virtual world, um, left, right, bottom, and top. Right. And, and, and they really are here with the clipping planes, with the Z near and Z, Z far. Right. They really are, if you're using the GLU Ortho 2D, kind of setting the the stage for what the scale of your world should be, yeah, if you it think is. about it. Um, for the Z near and Z far, it's basically setting um, GLU Ortho 2D is the same as GL Ortho, except it's passing negative 1 and 1 exactly. to Z near Z far. Exactly, that's just predefined for it. Yeah, exactly. And if you need more Z area, let's say you have a side scroller, right? Mm-hmm. And you have a character and a crate and a backdrop. Mm-hmm. That's three different layers, if you will. So even in a 2D kind of context, you still have a, a, a Z depth, that's if you correct. will, that allows you to stack objects on top of each other. So that is an orthogonal projection. Okay, now before we really move on, ah, the projections. Some of our complete beginners may be thinking right now, wait a minute, this is a bit confusing because we were dealing with the model view matrix Mm -hmm. and we had a vertex location and if we did any manipulations to it, then that vertex was multiplied by the the model view matrix so Mm -hmm. that we can establish its new position. Right. Um, Why the projection matrix? And here's why. Because now we need to recalculate Mm -hmm. all of these vertices in their space in which they now exist so that we can determine how they are going to be shown in that viewport. Exactly. That is the key thing here. Right. And that's very important to keep in mind because you do have the model view matrix transformation, which allows you to move your objects around. And then you have your projection, which distorts your objects in some cases. Right. So, um, yeah, it, basically your vertex is getting modeled by, or excuse me, is getting multiplied right. by both of these uh, matrices it's right. for two it's, different reasons. Exactly. You get multiplied by the model view matrix and then by the projection matrix. That's and we'll, right. we'll see a whole chart of that right. you know, very soon. So we have our orthogonal projection. Which means, obviously, we're going to need a perspective projection. Exactly. And again, there is an easy way and a hard way to do this. <laughs> obviously, a perspective is going to simulate real world. So we're going to have the vanishing points, mm-hmm. as we've described. And as things get further and further away, they're going to appear to be a little bit smaller and right. a bit distorted. And we do have a GL frustum, which allows, which actually has the exact same parameters as our GL ortho. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't provide anything that's particularly user friendly well, for, for us. for things that we may be familiar with with 3D applications right. or cameras in general, mm-hmm. such as a field of view, mm-hmm. how much a- we uh, the user can see, exactly an aspect ratio, right? Um, and then of course we've got a clear, a, a near and a far clipping plane as well. Right. But the field of view and the aspect ratio is something that those that are familiar with 3D applications are pretty familiar with. Yeah, definitely. And you can see where using GL Frustum, you, you don't have that at that, your That kind of control, no. Right. And that's where GLU Perspective comes into play, which is an interface, as with GLU Ortho, into GL Frustum that allows us to have things like our field of view, which is our first parameter, and an aspect ratio. So we can very, very easily create a 3D virtual world with proper perspective. And, and the everything. aspect ratio is, is simply the, uh, the width over width the, the height. height. So right. that if your window size changes, say your width is bigger than your height, you can pass the correct aspect ratio and everything maintains the same area. Exactly. And which is very, very important when you start working with your own application. But again, here we are looking at the matrix, mm-hmm. the, the actual matrix used for determining the perspective projection. Yeah. So your vertices would be multiplied by this to determine their distortion. Exactly. And again, that's after they've already been multiplied. By the model view matrix. By the model view. That's right. right. Not the world view. No, the model view. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tape something to my finger. I'm going to call that world view forever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so with our perspective projection, that finally brings us into our final slide, which is basically an overall view of how exactly, given a vertex, how it's transformed to the final state in which it's displayed onto our monitor. That's right. And that's typically referred to as our vertex transformation pipeline. So how does this work? We start out as a little vertex with an X, Y, Z, and W coordinate. 
And these are typically referred to as our homogeneous coordinate system. And without getting extremely technical, this is OpenGL's way of allowing us to do uh, represent our vertices in a in a 3D world that we're used to with X, Y, and Z. Right. But also allowing us to do perspective deformation so that we can simulate the real world. So that's homogeneous coordinate systems. Nice. Um, Two dollars so for getting the word in there. <laughs> <laughs> so we start out with our vertex. So that's our object coordinates. Our object coordinates. And it goes through our model view matrix. In other words, it multiplies the current vertex by the model view matrix, and that converts it into eye coordinates. As we were talking about before, it converts it into our camera viewing area. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it goes through our projection matrix, which is what we talked about just now, distorting it however it needs to, in which case it gets into clipping coordinates. And it's at this stage that well, if we there's... We can disregard everything that's outside of our clipping coordinates. That's right. I mean, if there's something that we can't, we can't see, right. there's no point in actually rendering it. No, because what a waste of CPU power if it did. Exactly. And then it does perspective division, which converts it back into a um, non-homogeneous um, coordinate system. Oh, wait, so if that's we confusing, the w. If we drop the W exactly, <laughs> uh, which converts into normalized clipping coordinates, and then finally we have our viewport transformation, um, which converts it into window coordinates, which is the final thing that you see inside of your window. Yes, finally a 3D view that's been distorted, so it looks like I'm looking through a 50 millimeter lens or a 45 millimeter lens or whatever. Exactly. But I see it on my flat monitor screen. Yes. yes. So there, yeah, that is the whole vertex transformation pipeline, and this is happening for every single vertex. vertex yeah, yeah, it is. So there's a lot going on, Absolutely. but once once you get everything set up, it's not really that complicated to no. set up, as long as you understand what's going on behind the scenes, because that's kind of what we're pushing here. Even though you can go through your OpenGL experience knowing very little about what's going on behind the scenes, it's very, very important. For sure. So just keep in mind, we've got the model view matrix. You said it. You got it. I've only messed up twice. I don't know why. <laughs> I think you stuck that word in the back of my head. Aww. But we've got the model view matrix, which is used for simply determining where our objects are going to exist in the world, yep. but then the projection matrix, matrix, you can now see how this is extremely important in multiplying the result of the uh, each of the vertices that have been pumped through the model view matrix right. so that we can get the proper distortion, their proper location in regards of what's going to end up being on your screen. Exactly. And that's pretty much it for this video. Yep. Wow. Yeah. A lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. So anyways, this is going to become more and more apparent as we start getting into developing some applications. Again, we're going to be making a very simple application coming up with a rotating cube. Just keep in mind, when we show it to you the very first time, we're going to be inside the cube. Yes. So just put in the back of your head, one of the first things you're going to see us do is a GL translate because we need to move everything away from the camera. Right, so we can actually see the object. That's right. And so with that, that's going to wrap up this lesson. Thanks a lot, guys.